Let's talk about a type 4 um, hypersensitivity reaction um, that causes uh, the disease known as celiac disease. So a type 4 reaction, if you recall, primarily involves T cells inducing inflammation and damage to organs and tissues. So the organ and tissues we're going to talk about are the digestive system, specifically the intestines, the small intestine. And so here I've drawn an intestine, and I've got some food in the intestine. And what is that? It's gluten, right? Gluten is a protein. Uh, it's a series of proteins actually found in um, bread dough. And there's something interesting uh, about the gluten proteins. So it has a lot of proline residues in it. That's why I've drawn some P for prolines. And it has a lot of glutamine residues. And I've drawn them there as Qs. So uh, why is that interesting? Well, when we digest proteins, we know from fresh in biology that proteins need to be broken down by proteases in the digestive system. Uh, and those proteases could come from the gastric glands, they can come from the pancreas, they can come from the lining of the small intestine. And the idea is to break down proteins into polypeptide chains or peptide chains, and then single amino acids, which can be absorbed into the circulatory system and used to build our own proteins. The thing about the gluten protein is that it's somewhat difficult to break down, um, in part due to all the proline residues, the secondary structure um, that uh, proline residues uh, put into a peptide chain make it difficult for proteolytic enzymes to process them. So gluten proteins are, aren't uh, sometimes broken down into single amino acids. So we have these little polypeptide chains, or these peptide chains. So we know we have lymphatic tissue uh, in our digestive system. So we've got things like called Peyer's patches, or the galt gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissues. And we've got uh, cells there looking for pathogens. So here comes this peptide, and it can be taken into um, the lymphatic tissue underlying the lymph node, underlying the GI tract. Now, something happens to it here in individuals who suffer from celiac disease, and it involves an enzyme called tissue transglutaminase. So trish, uh, tissue transglutaminase is an enzyme that modifies um, amino acid side chains, specifically modifying glutamines. So it is a deaminating enzyme. What does that mean? It will remove the amine groups from the glutamines. And when it does that, it converts them into another amino acid called glutamic acid, or glutamate. So you can see there that the Qs are converted to Es. Glutamine is converted to glutamic acid, or glutamate. This is done by this enzyme tissue transglutaminase. Uh, um, now, what has happened here is the peptide, which didn't have a charge maybe before, definitely has a charge now, because if you recall, glutamic acid is negatively charged. So we took a peptide that wasn't necessarily charged and is now negatively charged due to this enzyme, this cellular enzyme processing the peptide. Well, let's say a phagocyte, such as a dendritic cell, uh, phagocytosis, this uh, protein or peptide, and presents it on MHC class two molecules to T cells. Now, uh, what's the likelihood that we're going to present this peptide, right? We need a peptide binding motif. Individuals who suffer from celiac disease seem to inherit a set of HLAs that preferentially present these peptides. So there are uh, HLA um, alleles that increase the risk of an individual to, uh, to suffer from celiac disease. Uh, and I've shown here the HLA DQ gene. So there's DQA which makes the alpha chain, DQB, which makes the beta chain, and there are different alleles of these genes, right? So I've got DQA05 or 03, DQB02 or 03, and when you put them together, the A alpha and the beta chain, they make these allotypes called HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. So individuals who inherit these allotypes uh, have a higher risk of celiac disease. Uh, why is that? Well, these um, proteins, the uh, alpha and the beta chain of MHG class 2, that arise from these alleles, um, have positively charged amino acids in their um, 
region that holds the anchor residues. And we know that this peptide now is negatively charged on its um, glutamic acids. So these peptides load really well into these HLAs, this HLA2 or MHE class 2 molecule encoded by the genes um, for DQ2 or DQ8. So individuals who suffer from C-like disease are much more likely to present these peptides to T cells. And if a T cell has a T cell receptor that binds strongly to this peptide, this T cell is going to activate and it can turn into a Th1 helper T cell, which would uh, also help a macrophage out. So here's a macrophage taking in that peptide, and again, it has been uh, converted to uh, glutamic acid on its um, glutamine residues, and it's negatively charged, and the uh, HLA, DQ2 or DQ8 or another um, allotype that has uh, the ability to hold a negatively charged peptide holds it in there nicely, presents it to T cells, and the T cell says, yep, that uh, I recognize, let's launch an attack. So peptide, it's not a pathogen. Uh, in this case, we would call it an allergen because the immune system is recognizing something that is not toxic to the body, shouldn't be toxic, it's not a pathogen, but we just so happen to have HLAs that present the peptide really well, and we happen to have T cell receptors that recognize the protein, the, the peptide really well. And if this is the case, then we're going to get inflammation because activating the helper T cells, that's going to be releasing cytokines. Macrophages, they're going to be releasing cytokines. And so what occurs in the lining of the small intestine is massive inflammation, which leads to the destruction of the villi in the intestine. So here's again a drawing of intestine, and there's some food in the intestine, and we know that absorption occurs through the uh, cells that line the villi, the brush border cells that line the villi, that have microvilli on them. So when an individual with celiac disease uh, takes in uh, gluten, if they eat gluten, the gluten proteins are broken down, but not well, and then these little peptides are uh, taken in and uh, presented to Th1 cells. So these peptides can be taken in by dendritic cells, they can be taken in by macrophages, and if that's the case, you're going to have inflammation due to macrophage activation, due to helper T cell or CD4 cell activation. It could be Th1 cells, it could be other uh, cells, other uh, type of uh, helper cells. And the result of this repeated inflammation is the destruction of the villi. The villi become so damaged by a repeated balance of inflammation that the uh, villi um, are destroyed and you have something called bilious atrophy. And in the individuals who lose their villi, right, they're not going to be able to absorb all their nutrients, so they might suffer from malabsorption. Um, they, their food tends to move quickly through their intestines because the surface area has decreased dramatically, and they suffer from things like diarrhea, and it can be a very severe uh, disorder. The other thing that occurs uh, in individuals who suffer from celiac disease is uh, they generate antibodies that bind tissue transglutaminase. So they're, uh, now it's like an autoimmune disorder, almost. Um, so tissue transglutaminase, again, it's an enzyme. It's a cellular enzyme. It's actually normally found inside of cells, not normally found outside of cells. But it is released from when cells die in the intestines. Um, so it, uh, where there's intestinal damage, this enzyme comes out. And the enzyme can interact with gluten peptides, right? Because that it fits in their substrate uh, binding pocket, and it's going to convert um, the Q's to E's. Um, so what can happen is naive B cells can be wandering by in the uh, lymphatic tissue in the intestines, and it is possible that a B cell receptor, its antigen binding sites, will bind tissue uh, uh, tissue uh, transglutaminase because the B cell maybe was not shown this enzyme in the bone marrow. There was no negative selection against a B cell receptor that binds tissue transglutaminase. So it's not surprising that uh, any person would make a B cell that would have an, an, uh, an immunoglobulin on its surface that binds tissue transglutaminase. And here, though, we've got lots of tissue transglutaminase being released from dead and dying cells in the intestine. 
So we're increasing the likelihood that a B cell is going to interact with tissue transglutaminase. Now, what's going to have to happen for naive B cells to activate, it's going to need to take in the tissue grain transglutaminase via receptor mediated cytosis. Along for the ride comes that gluten peptide. And the B cell processes what it takes in and present what's what it takes in on um, the MHC molecules. Now, it could present uh, pieces of tissue transglutaminase, and maybe we wouldn't recognize that with a T cell receptor, but we already know that um, the uh, gluten peptide presents really nicely in this individual who has suffered for, from uh, celiac disease. So there's that MHC2 again that has the positive charge model, um, amino acids in its peptide binding domain, so it's presenting this negatively charged peptide really well to T cells. And if this is the case, the B cell will activate and it will secrete anti-tissue transglutaminase antibodies. Um, this is actually used as a diagnostic tool um, when uh, clinicians want to diagnose celiac disease because there are many different types of intestinal disorders that may or may not be celiac disease. One of the keys to diagnosing celiac disease is does a person make antibodies to tissue transglutaminase? Because in other non-celiac intestinal disorders, that doesn't have anything to do with tissue transglutaminase. Only with celiac disease are we involving tissue transglutaminase, and it ends up uh, generating, the, the immune system ends up generating antibodies to it. So if an individual has uh, a damage to their villi and has antibodies against tissue transglutaminase, that is diagnostic for celiac disease.